Hey guys, so glad you're watching these sermons and these services. Uh, we love serving the global church and we just hear great stories, more and more of you saying, man, this is how it's blessed me, this is how it's changed me from all over the world. So that's crazy, we love that, thank you. We don't want you to just watch, we want you to get engaged uh, with what Village Church is all about. So join us, this is villagechurch.com slash groups. Uh, if you wanna support us, this is villagechurch.com slash give. It would be super helpful to get you giving toward this because we can do more and more uh, stuff around the world that we love doing ministry, being able to use technology like this and serving all ages and stages. Uh, we are on a great mission to love and serve Jesus and reach the world. And glad you guys are a part of it. Thanks for watching this. Hopefully you enjoy this week's teaching. Welcome everyone to Village Church Online or wherever you are around the globe. Maybe you're meeting in homes right now. Maybe you're with your community group. Maybe you're just by yourself and maybe you're watching late. It doesn't matter. Right now, you have the opportunity to engage with Jesus in a way you haven't before. And that's what I've seen over and over and over again here at Village Church. You know, I've actually been here for about eight years. And in that eight years, I have been challenged and consistently grown and shaped to actually understand Jesus in a different way. And it's through a lot of times your own experience. It's through the people that I've had the opportunity to come alongside and to have a front row seat to see what Jesus is doing through Village Church. I mean, even when I started, when I came here, it was just one site. And now we've seen that grow and expand. And now it's this incredible global movement. But make no mistake, it's about what Jesus has done and what he's accomplishing in the world. And it's never a group of people, even though he uses that group of people, it's all him. And we're gonna engage with a story today that's gonna to remind us of that. It's gonna remind us of his power in the world and what that means for your life. It's gonna remind us of his truth in the word and what that means for your life. And it's gonna remind us of his sacrifice and how that can ultimately transform everything you experience. Everything from the big things to the little things, from times of desperation through to times of thriving through all the areas of your life. We have a story here that if we engage with well, will really help shape who we are, but it doesn't come without questions. It doesn't come without challenges and even misconceptions. So I'll have you turn to John chapter four, and I'm going to read to you through verse 46 to 54. We're going to close out the chapter and finally move on. We'll be done this book in about seven years. Um, and I'm just going to go through and kind of talk a little bit about what it looks like, the story of what Jesus is doing in this official's life and to the people around him. And it starts in verse 46, John chapter four. So he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was this official whose son was ill. When the man heard that Jesus has come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. Will live. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoke to him and went on his way. And he was going down, his, and as he was going down, his service met him and told him that his son was recovering. And so he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. It's clear that this story is about this official and his son. It's clear that this story is about this miraculous healing that Jesus did in their lives, where Jesus actually healed the son from a remote distance and said, your son will live. But it's not without skepticism to wonder if this account can actually be something that we can base our understanding of God and the universe and our own existence in because we have these challenges, these questions. I mean, people heal on their own, don't they? Is it somehow some sort of timing where Jesus had a 50-50 chance of saying your son will get better and then his son did get better and the timing just tended to work out because that's when the son's fever broke? Or is there something going on here? When we engage with the signs and miracles that happen throughout the Bible, any point in the text, there's actually about 250 different miracles, depending on how you count, that happen in the biblical text. Jesus' miracles actually happen in three the book of John, we see that all of these miracles in the book are for a purpose. In fact, at the very end of the book, uh, spoiler alert, the John actually tells us that Jesus did so many miracles that if he was to write them all down, the whole world could not contain the volume of books it would be filled with. Like Jesus was a miracle worker. He was constantly healing. He was casting out demons. He was raising the dead. He was doing all of these supernatural, explicitly different things that people couldn't explain. And so it was quite the spectacle. I'm sure you can imagine. And so you come to this place in your own life where you have to wonder, was this coincidence or was there power? 
Did Jesus actually have the power to do the miracles that the Bible claims he did? Or were they just circumstances? They just happened that way. Were they just these random flukes that people took account for and then attributed to the God of the universe because it fit the narrative of what they were saying? And this might be where you get caught up and where your head actually goes to in the midst of all of your questions and doubts. The first hurdle, if we're gonna actually engage with the story well, is that some of you may not believe that miracles actually happen, that they're just not possible. Scientifically, rationally, from a naturalistic, natural naturalistic worldview, things only go one way. You drop a ball, it hits the ground. It never stops midair. It doesn't change. The rules of physics and gravity and healing and health and people, they don't change. We're in this system that's been created. Sure, you might assume maybe that was God. Maybe that was chance. Maybe that was evolution. Maybe that was uh, aliens. Whatever your philosophy is, whatever your worldview on that is, it doesn't matter. The real question is, are you philosophically able to recognize that you will put yourself in a box as soon as you believe things are stuck in a certain way? As soon as you believe nature's static, that it can't change, you can refute all miracles. It's not about the evidence of this one, it's about everything and things just don't go a different way. You see, the first thing you have to recognize and maybe even challenge yourself and is that isn't totally true. That as science progresses, even if we take an obser- a stance of observational science in the natural world, we realize that things aren't as concrete as we once thought they were. That things change all the time. Even now, the periodic table of elements, the thing that you grew up on, is being changed. They're adding new elements. This idea of subatomic particles, just this month, we realize that there are sub- subatomic particles that actually shift their state from matter to antimatter and from antimatter to matter. Like this large hadron collider stuff is absolutely wild. You can look into it. But the idea that nature is static and that things out of the ordinary don't happen is something that we're coming to the conclusion of that that's just not true. The possibility of miracles does exist. And so my hope is that just for the next 25 minutes, you might be able to crack open your philosophy a little bit. Just, just, just take a step back from what you think is exactly right, where you think we know everything there is to be known and wonder if something different can happen. Because if you open that up a little bit, this story comes to life. Like it'll actually start to change how you view not just miracles and the supernatural, but it'll change how you view the God of the universe. It'll change how you view yourself. It'll change how you view everything you engage with both natural order and process and the things that feel like they're even unnatural, supernatural, new, unbelievable. And that's part of the beauty of what the gospel is. It's this beautiful, fantastic story of this God who actually loves us and wants to save us from an eternity apart from him. That there's this brokenness in the world that we all experience and yet there's a greater story. And and this, this word, this Bible, his word actually can change that and so can change your perspective, your mind and your experience of the world at a whole. So let's go through this a little bit more thoroughly. So he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made water into wine. So this was uh, the pointer that this is gonna be another miracle story, okay? He had already done this miraculous sign where he turned these jugs of water into wine so a party could keep going. That's one of the coolest miracles, I think. Um, but then he comes back and he comes and at, the, at Capernaum, which is about 25 miles away, okay? Uh, downhill from Cana, there was an official whose son was ill. So this just sets the stage as far as what we're about to deal with, okay? We have Jesus who is in Cana and in Capernaum, there's this official whose son was ill and and there's nothing this official can actually do to save him. As it goes on, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and to heal his son. The idea that this man first heard that Jesus had actually come down into a town that was close enough for him to get to was the first point we have to recognize about what people believed about who Jesus was. The Galilee Galileans believe that Jesus was a miracle worker. It's no doubt that John actually had all of these different accounts of miracles of what Jesus was doing. Jesus was this guy who was doing supernatural things and people wanted to go and see it and believe if it was true. Even if it was true, they weren't ascribing him to be God, but he was a miracle worker. And so picture this, now in Cana, Jesus is there, there's crowds of people around him wanting to see the amazing things he's going to do. Do you live your life a little bit like this? Do you live the practice of your life believing that maybe there's something here? Maybe in Jesus, there's a spectacle that you might want to see. Maybe he has this power. You know, some of us wouldn't think this way initially. We wouldn't believe that our lives are and our experience and relationship with Jesus are tied into him solely being a miracle worker. But sometimes our actual practice of our life displays that. 
We sometimes believe that, man, if there's anyone who can save me from this place, it's going to be Jesus. And so in that, we can relate to this father in a very real way. We can be in a place where we think, you know what? Like when I'm good, Jesus is good far away from me. When I'm good, I don't need him close. When I have the money, the time, the relationships, the resources, the experiences, the curiosity, the woo for life, for everyday normal things, the physical things that I want, when those things are going well, I have no need for Jesus in my life. Like in a very practical way, we don't bring him into prayer. We don't thank him for the normal things. We don't take a moment to recognize the goodness and the grace he extends to us on a daily basis. But then when things get hard, when times move us to a place of desperation, sometimes we perk up and say, there must be something more. And this is exactly what happened in this story. He went to him, he went to Jesus, and he asked him to come down. This is to come down that hill, because remember he had this father just walked 25 miles uphill by himself to see this miracle worker because he believed what? He believed there was maybe hope for his son and to heal his son for he was at the point of death. This idea of desperation is one of the main things that I see who move people closer to Jesus on a regular basis. As a pastor, I end up being this place where people come to me and ask me to step in. We do this on a regular basis where it's like, Chris, there's this thing going on in my life. I need you to show up. I've tried everything. I've tried all the treatments. I've tried all the placements. I've tried all the people. I've tried all the counseling, everything I've tried. And my last resort is this desperate act that the God of the universe, who I maybe even a little bit believe is real, might be able to step in. Even people with great faith, they take themselves from a normal function of their faith and put them in this new category of relying on and expressing and calling out to the God of the universe who might actually save them from the thing they're going through. And it works. And it works. I see people's lives change all the time because Jesus showed up and healed them. I had a friend who had cancer. He ended up going through all this treatment and he was going through a regular check and they found a lump on his liver. They went in to actually do the biopsy and the lump was no longer there. This lump was gone. Absolutely gone. When? After we prayed for him. I had a friend who had blood clots all throughout his body and I went to the hospital and I prayed over him and without a doctor's explanation as to why all of the blood clots absolutely disappeared. I had this couple who came to me She was pregnant with twins and the doctor said that one of the twins was taking all the nutrients, basically starving the other twin to death. And if you don't abort one of the twins, you might lose both, they said. And this this family said, I can't can't abort both of these babies. I don't feel like I believe in that. I don't feel uncomfortable. That's just not gonna happen. And so we started praying. We went through James 5. We prayed in faith. We anointed with oil and the babies grew and were thriving and both were born healthy. We saw what I believe was a miracle of healing. Like there are places of desperation that drives people's faith and drive people closer to Jesus. But then there's the other side of the coin where I've also prayed for lots of people where it didn't work out. People who had terminal illness and ended up passing away, no matter how much we prayed, no matter how much I tried to recreate the moment that it provided healing that Jesus actually showed up in. And so we have this question of Jesus can, and he does, and he moves people closer to him as a result of it. And sometimes Jesus doesn't. And what do you do with that tension? If there's a Jesus and a God in the universe who actually loves us, why wouldn't he heal everybody? Why wouldn't he step in and heal my friend whose mom had cancer? Why wouldn't he step in and heal my dad who had a brain aneurysm? Why wouldn't he step in and heal my grandfather who had cancer? Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't wouldn't God God show up in the midst of your pain and your suffering and your divorce hearing and your trial for your kids and the questions around your health and the questions around your job and your future and your relationships and your money and all of the places you've prayed for him to enter into, why wouldn't he? And the problem is we start to worship God solely on the basis if he comes down and does the healing that we're longing for, does the healing that we're crying out for. We base our full experience and relationship of Jesus only on the fact that he is a miracle worker. Now, being a miracle worker isn't a terrible thing. Like it's not a terrible thing to believe that Jesus is or to even start your belief in Jesus in that. I actually had a friend who had this. He prayed for his aunt and literally put it on the table and said, Jesus, if you're real, heal my aunt and then I will believe in you. And Jesus healed his aunt healed his aunt of cancer, saved her. And then he started believing in Jesus and still to this day does. It was a great place to start. In fact, the people in Galilee that are surrounding Jesus are actually like, they're in this place. The majority of those people are in this place 
where they're just looking at Jesus as a miracle worker. And it's actually a really interesting thing to recognize. So let's just watch this here. So Jesus said to him, so this is Jesus talking back to this official, right? This guy who's a, you know, one of the king's guards, not generally a Jewish guy, comes up, wants his son to be saved, asks him to save his son. And Jesus says this to him. He says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. I find that to be an interesting thing. You see, the man, when we first looked at him, came to Jesus because he believed that Jesus could actually heal. He believed there was hope for his son in this man, Jesus, who was a miracle worker who was up in Cana. So he went to him to actually ask for this healing. Jesus turns to him and, and, and as you kind of dig into this text, different translations say it a little bit clearer, but he's not specifically talking to the official. He's talking to the crowd of people. He's saying, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. This is to this whole group of people who are like looking at Jesus as a miracle worker. And this is actually commonly known all around. N.T. Wright quotes this. He says, more thoroughgoing recent history has been, has been concluding that we can only explain the evidence for Jesus before us if we reckon that Jesus did indeed perform deeds for which there was at the time no naturalistic explanation. We must be clear that Jesus' contemporaries, both those who became his followers and those who were determined not to become his followers, certainly regarded him as possessed of remarkable powers. The church did not invent the charge that Jesus was in the league of Beelzebub, but charges like that are not advanced unless they are needed as an explanation for some quite remarkable phenomenon. This is the reality. People here believe Jesus is a miracle worker and they're wondering what he's going to do next. And Jesus says this, unless you see these signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. So there's this recognition that Jesus knows that even his signs and wonders may move you closer to him. So the encouragement is this. If you, for the first time right now, are thinking about Jesus, maybe you're in a place of desperation. Maybe you're in a place just like this father where you need Jesus to show up in your life to get what you want, to ultimately experience who he is, to change something about what you're experiencing. The call is to actually reach out to him. I want to encourage you to pray to him. I want to encourage you to ask other people to pray on your behalf. Why not ask Jesus for a miracle? Because for some of you in your own experience, you've experienced this and some of you haven't yet, but you will see a sign or a wonder in your life. And until you see it, you will not believe. And maybe you're in that place, but there's another side to that. The whole group experiences this. A lot of you will see the signs and wonders and you still will not believe. And that is the greater danger of these. This is like one of the chief worries of a text like this is that you might throughout your life see signs and wonders and moments in your life and question if God does not exist, even in the midst of those wonders. You'll try to always rationalize it away, or you'll sit in that space where you feel like miracles can't happen. And you'll say, well, then it, then it doesn't happen. This couldn't have been that. So I'm just going to believe it was something that we don't know. And this is a natural place actually where a lot of us go, even these like new age, uh, like atheist beliefs are, we can't explain it yet, but one day science will. That's where we're going to get to. And the question though is, is will you allow these signs and wonders to actually change deeply what you believe? Because if you believe and start to believe that Jesus actually still does intervene today, you're going to live your life in a different way and experience something way more. And even as a, um, as a Christian, even as someone who believes in Jesus, uh, sometimes we have this really dulled down experience of who God is. A really dulled down experience. One that makes us question like the reality, like it's not just about the signs and wonders and seeing the big things, but it's, it's less than that. You know, I used to work at a, a zoo of all places and I was this uh, security guard for the zoo. I had to go around and often make sure the cages were locked or make sure things are going well in the zoo during the day. So we'd ride around on golf carts and it was probably one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. Uh, but in the zoo, they had snow leopards and like snow leopards were one of these animals that I was like thrilled to see because I hadn't, uh, I, I had a toy as a child of snow leopards and this snow leopard would like wreck my Legos all the time, tear them to shreds, heads off, arms everywhere. Like this snow leopard was the bomb. But when I got to see them in the zoo, they were the most tame and timid creatures ever and all day. People would try and taunt them, try and get them to do things, try and get them riled up. Do something, do something. I had this one kid who threw like a ham sandwich through the cage and the snow leopards just looked at it. Like they would never respond to anything. They slept all the time, super lethargic animals. Um, but it wasn't thrilling. Like I had this experience that I, that I thought was going to be what I would rest see when I actually saw them and engage with them, but none of that. Until one night, one of my coworkers like said, hey, Chris, come for a ride with me. The zoo's closed. He's like, come check this out. 
So we go to the snow leopard cage and there's the two barriers, right? There's the one that they don't let you cross. And then there's the one that's actually right up against the cage. So he hops that first barrier and says, hey, Chris, come here. Not my most shiny moment. So we hop the cage barrier. And then he says, Chris, stand with your back against the cage. He's like, but not right up against us. Okay, fine. So I turn my back towards where the snow leopards are and have my back towards it. And immediately, boom, the snow leopard like pounces up at the cage, has his claws through the cage and is right at me. There was this new experience I'd ever had about these snow leopards that actually caused me to believe like these things are not as boring as I once thought they were. And maybe for you, like Jesus right now and his, your whole experience of him in your life is this boring, trite, tame, like, like, oh yeah, I try and do my best not to do this. I try and do my best to live this way. But like your experience is really dull. And I think it's because you're stuck in this place where yes, you you believe in the works and the wonders and the signs of Jesus, but there's somewhere more that Jesus wants to take you. He wants to use these miracles or the things he does in your life to move you to another place, another understanding of his love, another experience of your life, another experience for eternity, something so much more that's way less boring than what you've experienced because you've just been waiting for the big things, for the big things of him to do it. So now, whenever I went back and saw the snow leopards, knowing what they can do, it changed my whole perspective of them. Them. So let these moments actually move you closer to Jesus and change your perspective and understanding of who he is. Because the official said to him, sir, come down, come down before my child dies. This is urgency. He's saying, do something, Jesus, show up. I believe in your works. I believe you can do something. Yes, I'm going to believe if you do something. Yes, you're right. I might not believe fully if you don't do something, but come down before my child dies. It is clear that this man believes in the works of Jesus. And so Jesus said to him, go and your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Isn't this remarkable? Isn't this like the turning point of this whole story? One, Jesus said, your son will live. The very thing he was crying out to Jesus for, Jesus answered and said, yes, it will be so. Your son is going to survive. But maybe the greater thing happening here isn't the miracle itself. Maybe the greater thing happening here is this, is this man moving from a place of believing that Jesus is a miracle worker and believing and trusting in the word of who Jesus is the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. He went on his way. The story goes on to tell us that he didn't get back to his home until tomorrow. Like he didn't just walk home right away. Like he actually took his time. He believed Jesus, left Jesus there, left the miracle worker. And which is actually important for you to recognize because miracle workers and miracles were always tied together in the history of the world. The, the miracle didn't happen in the absence of the miracle worker. And yet here it is, Jesus from a remote place showing the deity that he actually possesses, helping us to believe that he's healing his son from a distance. Jesus still has that supernatural authority and power as he's fully man and fully God. And the man believes this. Are you in a place in your life where you need to move from believing the works of Jesus only turning to him when you need it, to actually believing the words of Jesus, which will open up a whole new experience of your life. Because if you believe the words of Jesus, it's no longer just your circumstance that dictates your faith, but it's now your faith that can begin to dictate your circumstance. This is the place where you can come to a, a full place of contentment, a full place of joy. All the things that the Bible says is readily available in Jesus happens when you move closer in your relationship with him. This is when you start looking at the text and believing what the Bible says about you, believing that you're made in the image of God and you have full value. How many of you struggle with the value that you have? How many of your internal voices tell you you're not good enough and you're failing and you'll never achieve that and you'll never be this and you'll never be loved and you'll never be cared for? Even when you have people telling you they love you and they care for you, you don't believe it because your internal voice hasn't been healed by the grace of Jesus. It hasn't had this real powerful change where you start to believe what he actually says. You move from believing what he can do into what he says about you. And that's one of my hopes for today is that you might believe in what he says. If you believe in the word, you believe that when you go through suffering, there's this moment where like down the road at the end of all things where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. If you believe his word, then you believe in the history of the resurrection, the truth that Jesus actually has raised from the dead and lives forever. And this is where it becomes really important because all of the miracles, every miracle that Jesus does, every single one of them has an end except for one. Lazarus rose from the dead. He died again. This son was good. 
he died again. This person healed from leprosy, died. This person healed from blindness, died. This person, you know, like, like exercised demonic authority over his life, died. Like there's still this issue of death. And yet the one miracle was the resurrection of Christ. This idea that Jesus, who was, became fully man, like he left his kingdom in heaven, came down, was fully man, lived amongst us for about 33 years and died on a cross for our sins, but then didn't stay dead that this miracle was that he rose again, showed his power over death and in that moment transformed eternity. And this is really important because when Jesus says, your son will live, when he says these words, your son will live, he's talking so much more. He's talking about so much more than just physically. There's something greater happening here in the story. You see, this shift from believing in his works to believing in his words is probably one of the most important shifts you can make in your life because it's going to change your perspective on all the things you want. My wife and I, we have um, four incredible sons. Okay, nine, six, three, one years old, these beautiful baby boys. And every time we go somewhere, people have a couple of responses. One, they're like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of kids. Like there's so many things happening right now. And we feel that too. The second is they always ask us, were you trying for a girl or are you going for the girl? That's what they say. They say, hey, are you going to try for try again? Which they know in their minds is absolutely ridiculous that we would make more. Um, but like, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to handle it. But there's that question of like, were you chasing the girl? Is that something you were trying to do? And the, and the answer is always, of course. Yeah, of course we were. We wanted a girl. After the first one, we wanted a girl. Every time we prayed for a girl, our second son, we prayed for a girl. Our third son, we prayed for a girl. Our fourth son, we prayed for a girl. Even when we came to after having our three boys and we had a couple family experiences where it was like three boys and then a girl, that was even mine. I have an older brother, younger brother, and then younger sister. And we got to this place where we were like questioning like, are we going to have a girl? Could we have a girl? After this, we're done. All of those different things. And we had friends even praying for us. We had friends like prophesy over us and say, you're going to have a girl. So picture this. My wife and I have three boys. We love them like crazy. Our third was this tornado child who just put us like basically closer to the grave than we've ever been. Um, but we love him crazy, He's super sweet, but he didn't sleep. Um, and then there's this whole thing now where we're have Mercedes pregnant with our fourth and we're going in to get this UC baby ultrasound where you can actually see the gender of the baby. And so we know what it all looks like. We've been there three times. We know what a boy looks like, all of that. And we get into the room and they have baby Mozart on. It's all low light. And I'm holding my third son with me. He's on my lap and the ultrasound wand goes on my wife's stomach and boom, we see it, a turtle. Like hundred percent, no question, it's a boy. And just to um, make it really like, clear just so we weren't like missing anything, even though our hopes were so high that we might be having a girl. Um, we asked the, we asked the ultrasound tech, Hey, is, is it a boy or a girl? And she says, yes, it's a boy. And we couldn't hold um, back what we were really feeling internally. Like there was a significant sense of mourning in that moment that we weren't going to have the girl we thought. And then to capitalize on that moment, my son who's in my lap just kicks his feet really hard and kicks the plug out of the ultrasound machine. So picture this, boom, shuts off the baby Mozart, shuts off the ultrasound machine, lights, everything's low at this point, dark. My wife is crying there on the bed. I am just overwhelmed with emotion. I can't believe this is happening. And there's this like pivotal moment of the D it is done. It's set. It's sealed. You're not having a girl. And my heart just like actually broke in that moment. There was something more I wanted. It's like, God, I've been faithful to you. I've been praying. I want this experience of a girl. The next day I did a wedding where this dad and his daughter walked down the aisle and I was officiating and I couldn't help but like long for that experience of him walk, of me walking a daughter down the aisle. I have friends, close friends who have these beautiful daughters and I would just love to have a baby of my own. I'd be like, it'd be a different side of me that I'd never gotten to experience. And so I mourned it and I mourned it and I mourned it. And there's this conversation that happens in your head where it's like, you're not mourning that you have this healthy boy. Cause I know a lot of people struggle around this and it can be sensitive for some people, but it's like, you do mourn the fact that you're never going to have this girl. And as we were praying about it, um, just about a, a month and a half ago, a little bit more, maybe my wife and I were talking about this and we were saying like, just how much we love our fourth baby boy. His name is Beckham. He's the most adorable thing we've ever seen. He's absolutely perfect. And we couldn't imagine our life without him. And there was this consideration of like, what if God knew better than us in the moment of our desperation? What would have been like if we trusted him through that? Because now at this point, if you had put us back there knowing what we know now and asked us, hey, would you like a girl instead? 
we'd say no every time because we want Beckham. We want our fourth boy. We want him every single time. And yet in that moment, without that knowledge, we would have asked for anything else. But in this moment, he knows more than we do. You see, this guy who wrote this book, John, that we're studying, uh, he wrote another book called First John and a few more, but um, I'm gonna read you this one part of First John chapter five, verse 13. He says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. He's saying this is the ultimate. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. This is an interesting verse saying, ask him and we'll receive, ask him and we'll receive. It's this idea that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we have, we have the requests. And the main point of this, and what I wanted to draw from this piece is, that the idea that moving to trusting who Jesus is in your life beyond his works, but to his word will change your experience in such a way where you trust, where you can actually trust the one who is the miracle worker. You trust his words in a way that impact your life. You can live differently, not in a place of worry and doubt, anxiety, fear, overwhelm, but in a place of joy, compassion, and trust that changes your experience of whatever you're walking through. I wish I had this perspective the moment that my son kicked out the ultrasound machine because then I wouldn't have been filled with grief, but I would have been filled with this moment that I have now where I celebrate every day the beautiful life that God has entrusted me with, which is my last son. It's like, I don't ask for anything else because I know better. And we have to wonder if God knows better in the midst of what we're walking through and that we might be able to hold on to that trust more than we currently do. And so this man, now knowing that his son will be healed, believes the word that Jesus spoke to him and goes on his way. And as he's going down, as he's going home, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he, had, when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. The father asks this question because he wants a further confirmation of what Jesus has done. I wonder if the servant's timeline was different than the father's, how the father would have reacted. Would that have been considered a miracle of Jesus or would it have just been like bodies heal, kids get better? What would that experience have been in your life and in his life? You see, every day we go through moments and questions like that things that we pray about and forget that we've prayed about, things where we have questions and desires of the God of the universe and he shows up and answers them, times when we just allot all the work that he's constantly doing to something else. But what if we were to understand the biblical narrative that God is actually sovereign and intricately in all of the details? What if this father now that he's moved into trusting God's word, believed and actually trusted that every detail of his life is actually orchestrated by this God of the universe who deeply and passionately loves him. Wouldn't that change your perspective if you believe that? There's a thought that G.K. Chesterton writes and I'm gonna read it to you here. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. I've experienced that. <laughs> Maybe you have to. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible then that God says every morning, do it again to the sun and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be an automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately and has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy 
for we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we. The Bible tells us to approach God like a child would in this childlike faith, to believe that he can actually do and consistently does things for us, to come to him in a way and believe maybe that every day that you wake up, God looks at you and looks at your life and says, again, do it again. Every morning where you feel like you've sinned and God gives you that grace and reminds you, hey, Jesus paid for that too. Don't bear the shame of that. Why? Because you're a child of mine. Now you're a son or daughter of mine. He says, do it again. He's like, repent again, live again, try again, move again, continue again, get back on the mission again. Like all of the things that are driving you off course from who Jesus wants you to be. He's gonna use signs and miracles and moments, big ones, natural ones, small ones, even the day-to-day details. And the question is, are you gonna recognize the presence of God constantly in your life and allow it to move you to a place where you yourself believe, where you believe that Jesus loves you, where you believe that God wants something more for you, where you believe that your experience of life doesn't have to be monotone, monotony, mundane, drab, repetitive, consistent, but that every day can be new, afresh, his grace, his life, his love for you, where he can say, do it again. And you say, yeah, I'm going to. I'm gonna experience this again, where you repeat the same things back to him. Do it again, God. Show me your grace again. Show me your mercy again. Show me your love again. Heal this person again. Do these things. Why? Because I trust your works. I trust your word. And I trust who you are. Because the belief that's happening here is one that's deeper than deeper than the, the belief that he had in the works that Jesus could do, deeper than the belief that he had in the, in the actual words that Jesus could speak. This is a deep belief in the gospel of who Jesus is. This is the moment when he believed. This is like the John three sixteen stuff, right? Like believed in him to gain eternal life. This is the deepening. Works are a great place to start. Words are a great place to be discipled through, but believing in the wholeness of who Jesus Christ is in your life will be the place that changes you for now and for eternity, changes your experience, changes your life, changes your longings, changes everything. And so the question today is, are you going to allow the experiences you go through in life, the times where you cry out to God like this father did, the times where he shows up, the times you have to trust him through the hardships, the times and the questions of everything that happens day to day, are you going to allow these things to move you closer to the God of the universe, to move you closer to this level of belief where all his household fell? When Jesus said, your son will live, he meant it. He meant for eternity, the son will live. And this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea in Galilee. These signs aren't uncommon. These signs are the truth of who Jesus is. And these signs are happening all around you. Would you take a heart posture and a mindset and a philosophical view to recognize that the world is more complex and beautiful than you ever could have imagined? Don't let sin and brokenness mar your view of what your existence is or who you are in Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus, and if that's what you've been living, a a, a world and a life where you've questioned and wondered, could there be more? Could there be more today and for eternity? I pray that over your life, you would experience more, that you would have a greater experience of who Jesus is, a greater experience of life now and eternity forever, a greater experience that says you're deeply valuable, incredibly loved, so worthwhile that Jesus would not only come and do miracles and signs, but he would do the one lasting miracle, which is he would raise from the dead after dying for your sins to show you how supremely powerful he is now and for forever. And all you have to do is believe in him. Believe in all who that he is. Believe the words he speaks over your life and believe that he can change and transform you today. And so Jesus, I thank you so much that you are so worth believing in, that you are so true to who you say you are that you love us deeply and you are in awe of who we are. And I just pray over the lives of anybody who's watching this, that you, Jesus, would encourage, that you use the things around their lives to save them and to show them who you are, to give them this ultimate level of belief, more than works, more than words, but everything of who you are. And Jesus, I also want to pray a prayer of healing over those who are sick, over those who are calling out to you for a miracle, Would it be your will that they would be healed entirely? That you would show up in their health, 
in their life, in their relationships, in their finances. And so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray that you would show up in so many of these moments and people would be able to attribute it for eternity to who you are and who you are in their lives. And for all of those who don't get answered, that where your answer is no, would we trust you that you have a greater picture of what you're trying to do in the world than what we could ever understand? And that would we trust you and be in that place where we still believe that we are with you for eternity. We still believe that life has so much goodness and opportunity to experience you in it. And that's worth pressing into you for. And I pray all of this in only the powerful and truthful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.